Good afternoon. Is the sound okay in the back? Yes? Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for coming here today. It's my pleasure to um, welcome you to our psychiatric grand rounds. And uh, my honor to introduce our speaker today, uh, one, of our, one of our own, uh, Dr. Uh, Nicholas uh, Brightboard. Nick has joined our Department of Psychiatry. Um, it's going in a year now. Uh, it's about in August. Started about a year ago. Uh, he came uh, to us uh, via Yale University, where he had been working on his postdoctorate um, studies involving uh, early uh, schizophrenia, early um, um, uh, first episodes of uh, schizophrenia, early um, uh, symptomatology of schizophrenia and in particular looking at non-pharmacological interventions, um, is, which is basically a, a very uh, timely and very sensitive topic. Uh, Nick um, uh, got his uh, PhD at UCLA where he worked with a team of folks that were uh, also involved in, um, in communication um, and um, cultural um, aspects of um, uh, uh, symptom expression and family in, uh, interventions and uh, he has since uh, arriving here to Tucson has been working both at a UMC campus and our UPH campus uh, trying to do uh, both aspects of uh, research education and clinical um, work um, at all sites and uh, he had also recently uh, establish a uh, clinic uh, called Epicenter and hopefully he'll have an opportunity to tell us some about that. We have some literature outside about that as well, which is one of the first uh, um, interventions in town uh, to really massively uh, bring an opportunity for people to, to have non-pharmacological interventions in a way that is cost uh, non-prohibitive. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, please help me wel welcome Dr. Breiboard and not let him use the time instead of using it myself. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Dr. Moreno. Um, I've been told I need to stay by the podium, and I have to warn you I have a bad habit of wandering while I talk. So um, if I do stray too far from the microphone at any point, which I'll try not to do, please feel free to give me a shout out here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about early intervention for schizophrenia. Um, and I thought I'd start off by showing um, the, the most complicated model of the development of schizophrenia I could find, or at least the one that would fill up most of the screen. This is uh, Nancy Andreessen's most recent model, and it is very thorough. And, and the, the gist of this model is that individuals with schizophrenia are thought to um, experience in their lifetime a number of hits that then activate a, a pathological process in brain development that over time gradually influences uh, underlying cognitive functions and ultimately results in sort of the hallmark symptoms of schizophrenia that we're used to, hallucinations, delusions, and negative symptoms. So let, let's talk a little bit about that pathological process in brain development that's occurring in schizophrenia as, as a brief introduction. Now, in normal brain development, what we know is that um, over time, the brain experiences first an increase in the number of dendritic connections between gray matter cells in the brain, that over time, these dendrites get pruned away, though, as the brain becomes more efficient. And, and this nice video here shows you a time-lapse uh, footage of what's going on over about a 15-year period as these uh, dendritic connections between gray, cell or gray matter and the brain are gradually getting pruned away, making the brain more efficient in its connections. It's only keeping what it needs at this point. Now, in schizophrenia, this process of dendritic pruning um, seems to be going awry. And we've known for quite some time that uh, there are gray matter deficits in individuals with schizophrenia. This is actually the, um, the results from the very first study of uh, gray matter deficits in schizophrenia that came out in 1976. 
Um, I put this up really more as a, uh, as a historical piece here. We can even see that it, we had to refer to people who had had uh, leucotomies in this sample here, something that you might not see in uh, more recent brain imaging. And, and you can tell just by the way that this is set up that this might not be the most uh, sophisticated analysis, but it did highlight the idea that individuals with schizophrenia um, have a decrease or have less gray matter on average than individuals without. And in this study that was uh, assessed by proxy by looking at ventricle size, which was larger in individuals with schizophrenia, indicating or suggesting that there was a reduction of gray matter that was uh, accompanying this increase in size of the ventricles. Um, we've come a long way since then and we've actually been able to see the pruning of the dendrites that's occurring in schizophrenia. So. Um, in this top slide here, we see um, uh, cells from individuals with, from an individual without schizophrenia, and we can see that there are lots of little dendrites springing out of it, getting ready to make connections with other neurons. And below that, in cells B and C, we see cells from individuals who do have schizophrenia, and it's pretty dramatic um, how these dendrites are over pruned in individuals with schizophrenia. Um, and we could then imagine that this disease is really best thought of as one of a problem of connectivity between the cells, that they just might not have the resources they need to maintain uh, adequate connections with other cells. To give you an idea of how bad this, uh, or how dramatic this pruning is in schizophrenia compared to normal individuals, this is a study that was done by Judith Rappaport's group out of NIMH where they followed um, a cohort of uh, young adults starting at around age 13 who didn't have schizophrenia and individuals uh, starting at that same age who did have schizophrenia. So this was actually an early onset group that we're looking at. And they followed them over time for about five years and as we can see that the annual loss of uh, gray matter in the group of individuals with schizophrenia is pretty dramatic compared to those without. This is a, uh, a progressive and uh, severe loss of gray matter that we're seeing that in some areas over time can reach about 20%. But it's not just the gray matter now that's disappearing in schizophrenia. We also know that there's problems with white matter development as well. Again, getting to this idea that it's about connectivity between neurons, how they transmit information to each other and within themselves that might seem to matter in schizophrenia. So this is normal brain development with white matter where we see an increase in white matter over time peaking at about age 50 and then gradually decreasing over time. It's a very different picture in individuals with schizophrenia. So this slide right here was from a study that compared three groups of individuals. Uh, those who were showing the early warning signs of developing schizophrenia, those with their first episode of schizophrenia, and people without any signs or symptoms of a psychotic illness. In the slide to the left here, we see a comparison of the white matter in individuals without schizophrenia compared to those who are showing the early warning signs of the illness. And already at that point, the individuals with the early warning signs are seeing dramatic reductions in white matter compared to the individuals without schizophrenia. If we look at the first episode group then compared to the prodrome or this early warning sign group, which is shown in the slide to the right, we can see here that that decrease in white matter continues over time. So the individuals with uh, first episode, or maybe time is the wrong word, but with disease progression, it continues. So the individuals with first episode schizophrenia who are showing the full signs and symptoms of the disease show even less white matter than individuals who are showing the early warning signs. So that gives you an idea of what this sort of pathophysiological process and brain development is that is going on in schizophrenia and that we think is linked to the symptoms. And if we're talking early intervention, if, if this was a public health talk, we'd probably be interested in focusing on this very top line in the graph here. These uh, hits that individuals might experience over the course of their lifetime that can potentially activate this pathophysiological process and brain development. I'm just going to talk briefly about a few of these that um, have been getting a lot of recent attention in the literature but also seem promising as uh, potential lines of intervention. Uh, the first one um, that was, I, I, I believe in Science is 2005, one of their issues was considered one of the top ten discoveries of the decade was DISC-1, this gene disrupted in schizophrenia which is located on the first chromosome. And um, to explain why a mutation in DISC-1 might uh, lead to the onset of schizophrenia gets back to this idea of connectivity between the cells. 
DISC-1 plays a very interesting role in brain development. As you're younger in adolescence, DISC-1 facilitates the migration of neurons throughout the brain and uh, the facilitation of new connections between neurons, essentially this establishment of new dendrites between uh, areas of gray matter so that the cells can speak to each other. Um, however, uh, as we know, at some point the brain says, okay, let's, let's prune off the cells that we don't need, the, the dendrites that we don't need to make the brain more efficient. And DISC-1 is also involved in that process as well, too. It tells the brain, okay, we no longer need to be making these connections between cells. We're at a point right now where it's not about learning new material, it's about making the brain more efficient and being able to do what it can do. So you could see then why DISC-1 could potentially play an important role in a disorder that is very much related to how cells communicate to each other. Um, interestingly, since its uh, discovery, it's become very clear that DISC-1 is not just associated with schizophrenia despite its name. Uh, we know that certain mutations in this, in this gene can produce schizophrenic-like symptoms in animal models, but alternative mutations in the same gene can actually lead to uh, depressive-like behavior in uh, animals as well, suggesting that this gene, despite its name, might, you might think this is more disrupted in severe mental illness, potentially, as opposed to disrupted in schizophrenia. Another promising area of research is maternal infection. And by this, I mean uh, maternal inf er, infection that is experienced by a woman while she's pregnant with a child that would put that child at risk for developing schizophrenia. What we know from animal models is that, um, that infections, as they uh, uh, appear during pregnancy, lead to an immune response that can uh, disrupt the developing brain in a similar way to what disruptions in DISC-1 will do in terms of facilitating or I guess restricting the number of connections that are made over time in the developing brain in terms of the dendrites that are formed in gray matter. Interestingly, um, evidence suggests that if we could just eliminate three specific infections in the maternal population, uh, these being influenza, toxoplasmosis, and uh, just general periconceptional genital or reproductive infections, that we would prevent one-third of all new cases of schizophrenia. So this is a very powerful area, potentially, to look at in terms of interventions. And finally, thinking about where we are in the country, um, I think it's important to note that immigration is also a risk factor for developing schizophrenia. Meta-analyses have shown that immigrants are three times more likely to develop schizophrenia than their age match cohorts in the country that they immigrate to, and that that risk is significantly greater if you are a non-white immigrant moving, um, in most cases, to a predominantly white country. And this comes from a lot of studies that have been done in areas such as Norway, Finland, the United Kingdom, looking at Caribbean immigrants moving to these areas, or West African immigrants moving to these areas. This has led to the hypothesis of a social defeat hypothesis, or the idea of a social defeat hypothesis, where prolonged exposure to being an outsider or having subordinate status in a culture is actually a psychosocial stressor, which can increase the risk for developing schizophrenia. Um, to test this hypothesis, we, we can't really look at in humans, but there have been a number of animal studies trying to test this social defeat hypothesis. They use a paradigm where essentially they get a a very big rat and a very small rat. And um, they take the small rat and they put it in the big rat's cage. And big rat's not happy. Big rat makes the small rat become submissive. Um, in a way, supposed to parody what, or to, to uh, be similar to what we might expect an immigrant in a very um, non-friendly and potentially threatening environment might experience. Um, and what we see is that that little rat after it's exposed to that over and over again, eventually experiences a sensitization of its dopamine system, this neurotransmitter that has for years and years been linked to schizophrenia and is often a target of many of our antipsychotic medications. So there is a, a physiological process that's associated with this uh, social event that would possibly lead someone to be more at risk for developing schizophrenia. Interestingly, if you take that small rat, and you take it out of that big rat's cage eventually, and you put it back in a cage with other rats that it knows that, that don't pick on it, um, over time, its dopamine system will desensitize and go back to normal, suggesting that this is potentially an area for intervention here. This is not an irreversible change in how dopamine works in the brain. Um, 
So with that in mind, you know, we should think about how uh, we as mental health professionals see first episode psychosis. And sorry I was a little thrown off there. I thought there was a slide that would be right there. It will probably show up somewhere in the middle here. But um, what we see is very different in schizophrenia. We don't see these early states where we can begin to work with. We see, uh, typically when people present to our offices, we see a devastating disorder. To give you an idea of how devastating this disorder is, by the time it shows up to one of our offices typically, we can look at um, a THARS study. It was a 20-year follow-up of individuals with schizophrenia. In the first line, we see that about 8% of individuals experience one sort of blip of full psychotic symptoms and then nothing for the rest of their life. The remaining 92%, though, will either experience, as shown in line two, uh, inter intermittent full psychotic symptoms with periods of full recovery in between, um, periods of full psychotic symptoms with partial recovery in between, or for the unfortunate other 8%, um, no recovery at all from psychotic symptoms over a 20-year course. Give you an idea of how devastating a disorder schizophrenia can be. But it's not just the person with schizophrenia who's affected by this illness. We now know that the, the devastation caused by this illness uh, expands beyond that person, and one of the first areas that it hits is their family members. Uh, this is actually a study that my colleagues in UCLA and I recently did where we followed um, a group of Mexican-American families caring for a relative with schizophrenia. And we looked at the physical health, uh, mental health, and general health of both the person with schizophrenia and the caregiving relative. And uh, what we found is that uh, the caregivers, these were typically parents in the sample, actually had worse physical health than their uh, relative with schizophrenia. And that's even after controlling for the age difference that you would experience there. Um, maybe more striking, though, was that their mental health, their level of depression and anxiety, was just as high as their relative with schizophrenia. So this gives you an idea of how severe the effects are that caregivers themselves are experiencing with this devastating illness. And finally, psychotic disorders um, exert a, uh, a, a really awful public health cost on, on the world and on the U.S. And in 2002, the estimated cost of schizophrenia in the U.S. alone was $63 billion. Um, interestingly of that, um, the largest component of this was indirect cost which comprise things such as lost productivity because the individual with schizophrenia is unable to work for periods of time, lost productivity on the part of caregivers because they can't work because they're caring for their relative, and also the money that caregivers extend towards their ill relative for their care. Those are, that's the largest chunk of this. The direct health care costs were only about $23 billion of this. Um, the non-direct health care costs includes things such as contact with the legal system, um, social service agencies, homeless shelters, etc. So with this unfortunate picture of what schizophrenia looks like in, uh, in the world, how are we treating it these days? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is not so good. Uh, pharmacotherapy is still the frontline uh, intervention for schizophrenia. Unfortunately, uh, all the large-scale reviews that have been done today suggest that in actual practice, pharmacotherapy is not being done efficiently. A large study out of the VA found that one-third of individuals with schizophrenia served in the VA system were being dosed outside of the recommended range. Um, and the largest proportion of that one-third were actually being overdosed as opposed to underdosed. We also know that rates of polypharmacy are high and growing in uh, schizophrenia treatment. Uh, one of the more common ones is the use of multiple antipsychotics. Uh, one common presentation will be the combination of an uh, atypical antipsychotic with a typical. We do know that in um, uh, inpatient settings where there is acute need, uh, this combination does help people get out of the hospital and get home. But in everyday outpatient practice, using multiple antipsychotics at once is uh, a risk factor for all-cause mortality over the next 10 years. So there's definitely a cost to this medication strategy to go along with the potential benefits. Another common strategy used uh, in terms of polypharmacy is the use of adjunctive mood stabilizers with an antipsychotic, um, anecdotally with the thought that this might increase the speed with which the antipsychotic takes effect. Um, unfortunately, uh, the various reviews of the literature of this, depending on how polite or critical they want to be about this approach, have either described the evidence for this practice as inconclusive or lacking altogether. Um, 
despite that, this practice is actually growing across the U.S. and how people with uh, schizophrenia are medicated. We also know that the antipsychotics, despite their usefulness in um, producing or reducing the positive symptoms of psychosis, also have a pretty awful effect when it comes to weight gain and the subsequent metabolic side effects that would follow that, such as diabetes or heart disease. Um, if we look on the far right of this, we see our, the two sort of more um, notorious offenders, uh, olanzapine and clozapine, which uh, in this study over a 10-week dosage of that at usual doses, people were putting on between 4 to 5 kilograms over that very short period of time. We know that this weight gain is also more severe if we're talking about individuals with first episode psychosis compared to individuals who've been ill longer. Uh, Alvarez, Jimenez, and colleagues in their review of the literature looking at both short-term and long-term studies of the dosage have shown that individuals experiencing their first episode of psychosis typically experience a much larger weight gain on the medications uh, than individuals who have been uh, ill for a longer period of time. I, I recently presented those last slides at a, a group of uh, psychologist and um, I, to keep things fair and balanced at the end I said you know there are a lot of problems with pharmacotherapy but I think the thing we can say that is at least people using this are trying um, this is a what we know about evidence-based psychosocial uh, care for schizophrenia is it's almost absent um, this was the results of a study that we just finished with my group up at Yale where we um, we were doing a randomized control study of a psychosocial, well, I guess we had medication too, but it was a comprehensive package of interventions for individuals with first episode psychosis. So we had some people that were coming to us and getting an intensive package, and another half were randomized out to the community to get whatever normal care they would get out there. And so we looked at over two years, okay, out of all these people who were randomized away from us, what type of care were they getting other than medication? And, and the answer was absolutely nothing. None of the evidence-based uh, psychosocial treatments that we saw for schizophrenia were being provided to these individuals or they were searching for out in the community. So um, to say that there are problems with pharmacotherapy is true, but to say that it's at least might be the only thing that people can rely on uh, in terms of their actual treatment in the community is also true. Unfortunately, not only are our psychosocial interventions lacking, our pharmacotherapy potentially problematic, but the de care that people are getting is oftentimes very delayed. Uh, people talk a lot about the duration of untreated psychosis, which is the period of time between the onset of full psychotic symptoms and the time you ever start getting treatment for those. And across the world, the average duration of untreated psychosis is two years. So once you start experiencing full psychotic symptoms on average, you're going to go two years experiencing those before you get any form of treatment. This is very unfortunate because we know most of the clinical and psychosocial deterioration occurs early in the course of the illness, in this period in which people might not be getting any care. We know that how severe your symptoms are in the first two years is positively associated with how severe they're going to be 20 years down the road. And we also know that if we can get people in earlier, if we reduce this duration of untreated psychosis, individuals will present to our clinics with uh, fewer positive symptoms, fewer negative symptoms, they'll be less suicidal, and it appears that for some of these outcomes, these might uh, persevere over time as well. So in total, we have this convergence of evidence suggesting that there's a need not only for improved care for psychotic disorders, but providing the care earlier in the course of illness. This is not a new idea. Uh, this is a quote that, oh, you know, probably 90% of every study on first episode psychosis tries to fit in there somewhere these days, from Harry Stack Sullivan back in 1927, where he noted that the psychiatrist sees too many end states and deals professionally with too few of the pre-psychotic. With this in mind, it would seem as if we should lay great stress on the prompt investigation of failing adjustment, rather than, as so often the case, wait and see what happens. I feel certain that many cases might be arrested before the efficient contact with reality is completely suspended and a long stay in institutions made necessary. So this idea of earlier intervention has been around for oh, 80 plus years, um, but more recently has been getting more attention in terms of the research but also the clinical services that are being provided. So what is the period for early intervention um, that I'm talking about here? Well, it spans this this area that I've tried to highlight with the red arrow here. 
in the prodrome period, where people are showing the early warning signs of the illness, but also during those first few years after full psychotic symptoms start, where as you can see in this hypothetical uh, figure here, someone is experiencing their greatest decline in functioning with the illness. So I want to talk briefly about prodrome research to begin with here. Prodrome literally means forerunner if you translate it, and, and many illnesses have what's considered a prodromal period. Uh, things such as diabetes or infective illness are often recognized as uh, common uh, illnesses that have a prodromal period that can be identified and that treatment can be provided during which you could prevent the ultimate occurrence of the full-blown disease. We now can identify individuals who are, uh, appear to potentially be in this prodromal period of a psychotic illness. The problem is not all of them will go on to develop the disease. Uh, our, our instruments for assessing this are good, but they're not perfect. And this creates a potential problem, a potential ethical problem, of labeling someone as being in the prodrome of an illness when in fact they might not be. In fact, we won't know if they're in the prodrome until they actually develop the illness. With illnesses such as schizophrenia or other severe mental illness, of course, the risk of giving someone a label is stigma. Um, and the potential uh, negative effects that that would have on the person. So in the literature, there's a move away from referring to the prodrome and referring to individuals who are, appear to be at ultra-high risk for developing schizophrenia. What do we mean by ultra-high risk? Well, as I'm sure most of you know that there is a uh, genetic risk for inheriting schizophrenia, that the more genetic loading you have, the greater your chance would be of having it. So if you have no relatives, with schizophrenia, it's about a 1 to 3 percent chance that you'll develop it in your lifetime. If you have a monozygotic identical twin with uh, schizophrenia, suggesting you have a high genetic load for the illness, it's about a 50 percent likelihood of developing it over the course of your lifetime. If we look at individuals who are in the ultra-high risk category, though, those uh, numbers look pretty small. Um, this was one of the first studies following people over time who meet this ultra-high risk uh, criteria. In six months, 43% of them developed a full-blown psychotic illness, and over two years, over two, or about two-thirds did. So this is a fairly reliable indicator that someone is on their way to develop a psychotic illness if they meet this criteria. I want to talk a little bit about what we're looking for, what we're talking about when we say ultra-high risk. Uh, there are three potential uh, ultra-high risk states that you can meet to uh, meet criteria for being in this ultra-high risk category. The first one, the most easy to operationalize in terms of clinical practice, is having a genetic risk for the illness and a recent functional deterioration. So you have to meet two criteria here. For the genetic risk part, you either need to have a first degree relative with a psychotic disorder, or you have to meet DSM criteria for schizotypal personality disorder yourself. With regard to functional deterioration, you have to experience a greater than or equal to 30% decrease in your psychosocial functioning over the last month compared to how you were doing a year ago. So um, oftentimes this second part um, can be a bit problematic to assess. Traditionally, the GAF is used to assess this, but everyone sort of has their own GAF radar in a way. Um, one of the more useful ways to, to use this if you're trying to diagnose someone with this is use one of the more anchored GAFs, such as the one that Hall put out in, I think it was 96, which actually has very specific directions with things such as how do I determine if this is a 32 or a 33, um, things that the DSM itself might not provide uh, as specific of guidance to be able to make those fine-tuned judgments. The second state that you can uh, have to meet this ultra-high-risk criteria is attenuated positive symptoms. These would be thought of uh, as being pre-delusional thoughts, maybe weird or bizarre thoughts that you don't necessarily have full conviction for. Also pre-hallucinatory uh, disturbances in your perception. This could be the, uh, the young child that you're working with who's talking about seeing shadows out of the corner of their eye, who talks about seeing uh, spots moving around on the walls or in water. Um, it could be also in terms of auditory hallucinations, thinking you hear your name being called at home frequently. And, you don't really know if that's true or not, but it sure does happen a lot. The final category you can meet is called brief intermittent psychotic symptoms. Um, to give you an idea of what that means, it's probably best to distinguish that from brief dis uh, psychotic disorder. So BIPS, or this brief intermittent psychotic symptom, is someone who's experiencing full psychotic symptoms for literally just minutes long, several minutes over the course of a day. This compares to someone with brief psychotic disorder who's experiencing these for at least a full day, uh, 
and has achieved, but less than a month, and has now achieved full remission of symptoms. BIPS does not require that you achieve full remission of symptoms. You just have to have a short duration in which these symptoms occur. So I want to read a vignette, um, one of the published vignettes of someone who is meeting this ultra high risk criteria so you can get a sense of what this might look like or feel like in your actual clinical practice. Um, patient was a 14 year old boy who lived with his mother and siblings. His biological father was deceased. He was referred to the clinic by a community clinician who after completing school requested evaluation was, this is in quotes, Concerned by the patient's derealization experiences, confused thinking, and unusual relatedness. Patient B's mother reported a significant shift over the previous 10 months in her son's ability to function at home, school, and with peers. Although usually quiet and compliant at school, he at times threw his notebook on the floor and shoved his classroom chair against the wall without provocation. Although gifted intellectually, his grades were slipping and he was having difficulty completing written assignments. At home, the patient began neglecting his household chores and personal hygiene. Other behaviors that his mother found unusual included his switching doorknobs in several rooms and moving his belongings between bedrooms. His mother also seemed perplexed by his social decline in the recent months. Rather than socialize with classmates or neighborhood peers, the patient was spending time in solitary activities. When asked about this change in his social pattern, the patient stated that he was mistrustful of others. The patient also reported that he was beginning to think that his eyes were playing tricks on him. He explained that during the week before the initial evaluation, he thought he saw a claw fly by his face, and several times the previous month, he thought he saw his classmates' faces morphing and blurring together. When asked to recall the onset of these perceptual experiences, the patient stated that they began two months before his current evaluation. When asked to explain how he understood his perceptions, he stated, it seems really real, but I know it's probably just my imagination. The patient also reported that he often was confused when others spoke to him and that others seemed to have difficulty following his train of thought. He denied ever having experimented with drugs or alcohol. According to the patient's mother, all developmental milestones were normal, no significant medication or psychiatric history was reported, and any past or current trauma history was denied. A recent eye examination showed no significant abnormalities. The patient's mother was being treated for clinical depression. No biological family history of psychotic disorders was reported. This individual met criteria for the attenuated positive symptom state for uh, the ultra high risk criteria. To give you an idea though, that might sound like many young children you might see. Um, and one of the challenges in diagnosing or identifying people in this ultra high risk state is all the potential rule out diagnoses. And to give you an idea of their scope, this is a list of all the uh, non psychiatric conditions that were associated with psychosis uh, from a recent issue of American Journal of Psychiatry. And that is quite a list to work through when you're trying to decide if someone's pre psychotic thought is because of an underlying and emerging psychotic illness or due to something else that's related to a more physical or medical condition. So what do we know about the, the prodromal patient or this patient at ultra high risk? Um, one of my favorite articles on this came out by Scott Woods and colleagues and he talked about the prodromal patient as being both symptomatic and at risk. So when you are, meet with one of these individuals, we know that they are now reliably diagno uh, diagnosable using some of the structured interviews that are, that are out there. They're already symptomatic by the time they get to you even though they don't have a full psychotic illness. They're cognitively impaired at this point already. On average, they're half a standard deviation below their age match norms on pretty much every measure of cognitive functioning, even before the full onset of full psychotic symptoms. They're functionally impaired. They're having trouble with school, with peers. Um, they're treatment seeking, but probably a more accurate way to, put, to say this is that their parents are treatment seeking. Uh, parents are coming saying, something is wrong with my child. I don't know what it is. Can you give me an answer? We know, of course, that they're at risk for developing a psychotic disorder, and unfortunately, they're in need of a definition of care. And, and to give you uh, an idea of maybe how much need there is for a definition of care, we can look at the, uh, the APA treatment guidelines for schizophrenia when they talk about how to treat individuals in the prodrome. And uh, as a bit of a side note, they've recently noted on their website that since these came out in 2004 and haven't been updated, that they are out of date. Um, so I will uh, give that uh, 
I want to let people know that. But at least in 2004, the most recent edition of the treatment guidelines, they say that currently clinical strategies should include frequent, careful follow-along evaluations with psychoeducation and support over the course of its prodrome to its resolution, either in remission or in the development of a treatable sim uh, syndrome. So essentially, wait and see. This gets back to the problem that Harry Stack Sullivan identified way back in 1927, that we too often wait and see what happens in these illnesses when we might be missing the opportunity to intervene. And I'd like to suggest that there is a window to intervene here that will be useful. A number of intervention studies have been done to date in uh, individuals in this ultra-high risk phase. I'm just going to review a few of the more seminal ones. One of the very first was looking at uh, olanzapine versus placebo in a randomized clinical trial. Thought being, if that olanzapine is helpful with people with schizophrenia, maybe it would be helpful for people at risk with for schizophrenia. What they found, unfortunately, was that 80% uh, of the people dropped out over the course of the study. No one liked taking this medication. And the reason why was over this nine-month study, these adolescent boys and girls experienced, on average, a 13% increase in weight gain. Um, something that if I think back to my own time in junior high would have been absolutely horrifying to have happen so quickly. So this is not a very tolerable drug for individuals in this ultra high risk phase, especially very young adolescents and young adults. For those who did complete the study though, this remaining 20%, there was slight evidence that olanzapine was associated with a decrease in these sub-psychotic prodromal symptoms. And there was a near significant difference where the people who got the uh, olanzapine were less likely to go on to develop a psychotic disorder in that nine month period than those who didn't. It didn't quite meet uh, uh, full criteria for statistical significance. In the end though, the authors of this paper said, you know, all we can conclude from this though is that uh, young adults in the ultra high risk phase don't like taking olanzapine and this is probably not the best way to go with them. Um, in terms of psychosocial educations, uh, two that have been looked at have been family psychoed and cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, briefly in this study by O'Brien and colleagues, they found that uh, after nine months of participating in multifamily group intervention, uh, individuals in this ultra high risk phase uh, experienced reduced positive symptoms and general symptoms, meaning anxiety and depression. They were uh, getting hospitalized less than they were before they started the intervention. They're doing better in work and school. They had better coping skills, and their family members talked about things being better in the family. They described the family as being more cohesive and able to deal with challenges that come up. In terms of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, I believe to date this is the only RCT of this, um, and the findings were, were fairly positive. People who got the cognitive behavioral intervention as opposed to just monitoring them and see how things would go over time, experienced a reduction in positive symptoms, they were less likely to develop psychosis, and they were less likely in need to be prescribed an antipsychotic, probably because their symptoms were getting better over the course of time. There have also been trials now looking at integrated treatments, both psychosocial and pharmacological. Uh, one of the first came out of Australia from Pat McGorry's group, where they looked at uh, an intervention with low-dose risperidone, about one to two milligrams a day, combined with cognitive behavioral therapy versus a control condition that included supportive therapy and antidepressants. That, that's kind of a weird control condition, but what they did was they said, if these people were out in the community, what interventions would they get for the symptoms that they're presenting with? And the answer that they found was uh, supportive therapy and antidepressants. So you can think of this as a trial of uh, integrated treatment versus what might be usual care in the community. The people who got the integrated treatment were less likely to transition into a full psychotic disorder at six months. Uh, was, uh, they were almost, uh, there were only 10% of them did compared to over a third of the control condition. And for individuals who during that six month period took their uh, risperidone for the entire time, that benefit extended for another six months after the intervention even ended. So a short time limited six month intervention had effects uh, six months after it stopped in this group. Um, interestingly, we see that over time there's a declining rate in conversion to psychosis in these people in the ultra high risk category. People have kind of scratched their heads at this. Um, to give you an idea of what this decline looks like, uh, presenting data from that Miller study that I presented before about six through 24 month transition rates, and then from a more recent uh, study from 2008. I chose these two because these, these are actually collaborators that use the same criteria for assessing the uh, ultra high risk group. This is not reducing the likelihood that this difference here is methodological. 
what they did when they saw this difference was they looked back over their study and said, well, what's happening? What's different for these people in 2003 compared to the people in 2008? And the only major difference between these two groups is the people in 2008 were more likely to be getting some kind of treatment compared to the people in 2003, many of whom were getting none. So now, despite this uh, potential benefit of ultra-high-risk services, uh, these services are few and far between in the United States. Um, I put this together using a book from Compton and Broussard where they tried and identify all the ultra-high-risk services in the U.S. As you can see, if you're anywhere between St. Louis and L.A., you have quite a long distance to go to and, and nothing here in the state of Arizona. The other place we can intervene when we're talking about early intervention psychosis is what's referred to as first episode psychosis. Um, unfortunately, that term's a bit of a misnomer. It gets used a lot in the literature, and you would think it would mean people who are experiencing their first episode of psychotic symptoms, um, but it doesn't. So in our recent review of the literature, we found that when we're talking about first episode, at least how it's used in the research literature, this term is operationalized to identify people within the first two to five years of the illness. And that's probably a more useful group to think about than those who are first experiencing psychotic symptoms, because that really seems to be the critical period in which the symptoms are getting worse and most of the deterioration occurs. So when I talk about first episode, uh, I'll do that because that's how it's referred to in the literature, but, but keep in mind that uh, the definition of that term doesn't quite fit with what you might think it would be. Two largest uh, studies of uh, working with first episode psychosis come out of Europe. Uh, the first is the OPUS study, where they said, okay, let's see what would happen if we just gave better care to people with um, first episode psychosis. Instead of just the usual care that's in the community, let's load them up with all sorts of psychosocial interventions on top of medication. So they did a randomized control trial where half the people got usual care, half the people got medication, case management, but also assertive community treatment multifamily group psychoeducation, and social skills training. And not surprisingly, at two years, the group that got the uh, more intensive intervention was doing better. They had fewer positive and negative symptoms at two years. Interestingly, in the design of this study, they only provide the intervention for two years. People get it for two years, they're doing better at the end, and then everyone just gets usual care at that point. They continued to follow up these people, though, three years after they completed the intervention. And what they found is if they looked at the people who had gotten usual care originally versus those who got the integrated treatment, well, three years after treatment stops, there's no difference between the two in terms of their positive symptoms or negative symptoms. But what was different between the group is that these people who uh, several years earlier had received this integrated treatment, these people were more likely to be living independently in the community and their uh, respective uh, comparable cohort in the group that got usual care three years after the intervention ended, they're more likely to be hospitalized or in supportive housing. Suggests there is potentially some uh, effect of this intervention that can last beyond the end of the intervention. Second major uh, clinical trial today is TIPS, also out of Europe. Notice a trend that most of these studies come out of Europe or Australia now. Um, they address this issue of the duration of untreated psychosis. And, um, you know, um, maybe if they could do an animal model, they could do a really good randomized control trial where they elicit psychotic symptoms in someone and then make them wait before they give them treatment. But, but in humans, this would be completely unethical to do. So what they did here to get around that issue is they said, okay, we're going to take four hospitals. Two of them, we're going to do nothing with. The other two, we're going to give um, an early intervention team. It was a van with a uh, psychiatrist and a social worker and a nurse that will report to anyone's house within 24 hours if they think someone's experiencing psychotic symptoms. And we're going to start this giant public education campaign in the areas served by these two hospitals, letting people know about what the uh, risk factors are for psychosis and what the early warning signs are. Um, not surprisingly, in the community served by these two hospitals that got the extra resources, people were getting into these hospitals earlier after the onset of psychotic symptoms compared to the hospitals that didn't have these early intervention resources. And in these uh, hospitals with the early detection services, people showed fewer negative symptoms at one year and at two year than their comparable cohort in the uh, hospitals without the early detection services, these people who are getting into treatment later. So in total, this suggests that um, intensive treatment can be helpful and beneficial uh, for individuals with first episode psychosis, more so than just usual care. There's some caveats here, though. We might need to continue this treatment for long periods of time to maintain the benefits. Uh, 
as we saw from opus, once the treatment disappeared, some of the clinical benefits disappeared as well. Um, but we might even be able to improve these services by complementing them with early detection services, providing resources for the community to help people be more aware of what psychosis looks like. So we're not dependent on them coming in when they're in an emergency. They might be able to come in when they first notice the early warning signs. Similar to uh, the ultra-high risk services, though, uh, despite the promise of treating first episode psychosis, these uh, services are pretty much absent in the U.S. Um, again, in 2009, uh, now you actually have to commute a little farther. It's uh, Chicago and L.A. If you're anywhere between there, you have to go pretty far. And again, uh, at least in 2009, there were no specialized services for first episode psychosis in Arizona. Uh, just briefly, I'd like to touch base on why this might be happening. Um, one problem has to do with the structure of the uh, health system here in the U.S. We have a, a divide between public and private insurance, which is one problem. Uh, this is especially problematic because in most cases, when people develop symptoms of psychosis, they're typically being covered by the, public, or by the private health insurance system and over time transition to the public health insurance system. This creates a situation where the private health insurance system is fairly reluctant to provide thorough uh, services for people that will eventually be off their uh, list in a few years. And the public health insurance system is, uh, is reluctant to provide cost of care for individuals who are not yet their responsibility, they would say. Uh, the second problem is the divide we have between child and adult services. Uh, the onset of psychosis tends to happen late teens, early 20s. If we're looking at when the ultra-high risk period is occurring, we're looking all the way down to maybe 13 or 14. So we're looking at a span of time that crosses two different health systems, which again, makes neither one of them very uh, motivated to provide funds to help the other one out for caring for their patients. And, and finally, with all of this, there's the issue of cost, which is, is, I think, unfortunately, always on people's mind when we're thinking about providing mental health care. If we're providing more intensive treatments, there will be initially uh, additional cost that accompanies these interventions. The question, though, is that over time, if people are doing better, if they're spending less time in the hospital, if they're working more, um, are these costs offset? To give you an idea of this question, um, I think this is actually the first cost effectiveness analysis of first episode psychosis in the U.S. that my colleagues and I did uh, back at Yale. And we looked at a, a hypothetical situation where we have this hospital serving a community of 100,000 people. Not all of them have psychosis, but a, a, a representative portion would compared to what we would expect in the general population. And we said, let's envision two scenarios, one in which this hospital just gives people medication. We consider that usual care. And one in which it gives all these people uh, medication plus multifamily group psychoeducation, one of these evidence-based psychosocial treatments for psychosis. It's going to cost them some additional money to provide that intervention, but would they see savings over time due to um, reduced hospitalizations and reduced visits from these clients due to uh, exacerbations of symptoms? Starting at two years, there was already a benefit for the uh, intensive intervention. You can't really see that here because it's so small, but um, essentially it costs about $2,000 more just to provide medication for this one hospital. And if we go out over 20 years, this hospital would actually save $4 million by providing a more intensive intervention package to individuals than just providing uh, medication or usual care. And um, to contextualize this a little bit, I went back to this study and looked at what it would suggest for the state of Arizona. Um, and thinking about our own budget, budget crisis here, you know, we can think about could we save money with better health care. So um, let's say that the entire state of Arizona did this. Everyone with first episode psychosis, when they present for treatment, they get not only medication, but they get family psychoed as well. In two years, the state would save uh, uh, what seems like a measly $256,000. And over 20 years, the state of Arizona would save uh, almost $155 million. So if we're, we're thinking about the budget deficit right here, here, here's potentially one way to solve it, by providing better services to people. Um, I'm, I'm running a little uh, near the end of time, so just briefly, I um, like to say that some of the treatments that we're having out there are improving for schizophrenia, that we're looking for um, new ways to treat people, to think about different ways to treat people. These include using antipsychotic medications not just as a mechanism to reduce symptoms, uh, 
but also to improve this uh, underlying brain uh, pathological process that's occurring, to protect the existing brain cells that are there, to promote greater connectivity between existing cells, get more dendrites growing there, and to promote the growth of new brain cells. And um, there's promising evidence that we can do this. Um, in this study, what you're going to see over here is a time-lapse footage of the amount of gray, law, gray matter loss in individuals with schizophrenia, some treated with Haldol, some treated with olanzapine. Um, over a period of about five years, people with olanzapine lose a lot less cells, suggesting that there might be a potential neuroprotective effect of some of these, more, these newer atypical agents. These atypicals, and, and potentially the typicals too, can also lead to the growth of new dendrites on cells. Uh, this was uh, where you have four cell cultures here. The top left corner is the control group. To the right is uh, olanzapine treated. Below that is clozapine treated. And to the left of that is catiapine treated. Uh, after seven days of treatment, you can see that some of these cells are already sprouting new, um, what uh, little uh, potential new dendrites there that could form after only seven days of treatment. And we also see that in certain areas of the brain, um, some of the new atypicals have the potential to actually lead to the, uh, facilitate the development of new brain cells. This is very, very preliminary work and is still kind of um, uh, inconclusive, but promising is what I would say, where um, different dosages don't lead to the expected amount of growth of new brain cells. Uh, going off the medication actually leads to better cell, more cells than if you stay on it. But there seems to be some potential here that these uh, new medications can lead to the development of brain, uh, brand new cells in the brain. So um, with that, I'll, I'll stop and thank you very much for your attention today.